they really just have so many flat wheels. When you actually think about Tesla in 10 years, <laughs> if they continue on this arc that they're on, it doesn't really make any sense how big of a company this can be. Their flywheels are in areas that are huge markets. If you're a Tesla investor or someone following Tesla, today we're gonna have a little bit of fun. We're going to explore what Tesla might look like both in the near future and in 10 years. And really 10 years is such a short time. And yet the changes to our lives will be more than we can even imagine. AI, humanoid robots, autonomous cars, cheap, plentiful energy, and new businesses Tesla has not yet announced, potentially and likely food, energy efficient homes, electric vehicle aircraft and boats, just to name a few. Some people think investing in Tesla might just be the smartest move you make. Let's find out what the risks might be. We'll look at all aspects of Tesla's business from the investment thesis, the competition, products, and of course, the management and team among others. One person who I'm, I'm excited to talk with is Dylan Loomis. Dylan was previously a financial advisor who's now running a very successful YouTube channel called Electrified. With nearly 100,000 subscribers, his videos typically get 50 to 100,000 views each. And he's been doing this for four years now, covering everything from the vehicles, including the upcoming Cybertruck, the competition like Ford, GM, Renault, Audi, and more in a regular news format that keeps us up to date on all things Tesla. So thank you, Dylan. Thank you for joining me. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Herbert. It's great to be here. That was a killer intro, by the way. But yeah, I've been looking forward to chatting with you and your community for a while. So happy to do it. Thank you, Dylan. Looking forward to getting brighter. Let's go. Okay. So thank you very much, Dylan. Um, I've also been following you for a long time, like many of us have been. You're really one of the uh, original uh, Tesla kind of uh, experts that are out there. And you obviously follow Tesla very closely. You do these daily videos in this beautiful, well-designed, published um, news format. But then you recently tweeted this out that caught my eye. You said, sometimes I find myself imagining Tesla in 10 years. And remember, we really haven't seen anything yet wild so tell me what is it that you're imagining and you know like let's frame this in terms of not just in 10 years but let's bring it down from 10 years and then bring it down to even just six years and then maybe even three years from now absolutely so to start i have to say on that original quote i have to give a shout out to the true ogs the galleys the hyper changes of the world even rob yeah. i started listening to tesla daily's podcast long before he was on youtube and uh, I loved it. And I've been a huge Tesla fan since about 2012. So shout out to those guys because they really blazed the trail. And that was kind of that second phase, we'll call it. Mm. But to answer your question, yeah, I mean, I think before we get into Tesla 10 years from now, it's important to understand where it's been because, you know, a lot of people jump in now and they don't understand the history and kind of where Tesla is at and its lifetime arc, right? 2010 IPO, we'll talk about Tesla stock. So for really a 10 year period, Tesla essentially went sideways when you're zoomed out. You know, they were just quietly executing. The whole media narrative was the Tesla making golf carts, you know, all the <laughs> doubters and all of that. But they just continually executed and, you know, stayed alive, right, for 10 years before they actually did what in 2020? Turned their first profit. I think 2020, they made maybe $700 million that year. It was the perfect timing. Perfect catalyst because then from 2020 to the end of 2021, that two years, Tesla went on a historic stock run. Absolutely. Again, you can get into like how much of that was driven by the macro and quantitative easing and low interest rate mm -hmm. environment. There were just so many. It was the perfect time, perfect storm. And then, of course, we had 2022, the exact opposite, right? It was probably the worst year for Tesla when it comes to Tesla stock. And so... It's essentially been a re-rating of Tesla. You know, how are we going to value this company after all of that euphoria, essentially, from 2020 and 2021? Then, when so when you look at Tesla as a company, all of their metrics have been growing, right? Revenue, profits, uh, free cash flow. It's all steadily been growing up. But last year, you had the stock steadily going down. So a lot of people that may not be super comfortable investing in individual stocks are probably wondering what's going on here. And of course that, you know, gets into the macro conversation because we've switched quantitative tightening, higher interest rates, all of the things that most of us know about. So all of that to say, where do we go from here? Obviously we've broken a lot of um, the 200 day moving average and tech, some technical things. So are we entering a new bull market? You know, are we going to have another pullback because 
you know, the economy is going to slow down. It feels like there should be more pain for what we did, you know, in 2020 with the money printing, but that's anybody's guess. But yeah, to get to your original question when it comes to Tesla. Yeah. So they really just have so many flywheels that I think it's hard for a lot of people to really understand. And I want to, I'm very rational, logical, but when you actually think about Tesla in 10 years <laughs> and think about how, if they continue on this arc that they're on, it doesn't really make any sense how big of a company this can be because their fly walls are their fly their fly wheels are in areas that are huge markets. Auto, energy, Optimus, which doesn't even really exist yet, but you know, replacing labor, you know, what is an economy, that whole conversation. But with these flywheels, as Tesla continues to develop the best products in the industry, they sell more. When you sell more, the costs are driven down. And that's all paired with technology being at the right time. Lithium ion batteries, the cost coming down. And um, so there's a lot we could drill into from that aspect. But I think one thing that's not forgotten about, but these flywheels, so in the auto and the energy side, and then Optimus and AI is kind of the overall umbrella for Tesla, integrating AI into all these different parts of its business. And as Elon yeah. says, at least on the automotive side, they do it better than anybody else. You can't see second place with a telescope. That's what Elon says, but these flywheels can almost connect in the future. You know, you think about Tesla getting to, into the home HVAC with, um, you know, solar Powerwall, and then the the car that's charged. And you think about superchargers with mega packs and solar and the cost of en energy essentially approaching zero as Tesla earns all this revenue. Now, of course, they they'll pay for the cost of the mega pack and the solar and all of that on site. But once it's there, I mean, for as long as those products last, and Tesla hasn't done that really at a, at a big scale yet, but that is the future. That's the plan. Um, so ultimately, yeah, to kind of wrap up this initial question, it's just the perfect company, right? They have the perfect branding, great, um, great mission at a great time when we have this existential crisis of climate change. So people can buy into not just the product, but the mission of the company as well and feel good about those products. That's, a, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just the product. Um, Tesla has both. Again, perfect timing. The technology is there. The costs are coming down. The government is on board. That's not always the mm -hmm. case. I mean, you look at the Inflation Reduction Act and these billions of dollars approaching hundreds of billions of dollars that of these investments in gigafactories and chip factories that are being announced. I mean, that really, that whole movement, if you look back five, 10 years, was spearheaded by Tesla because guess what? Nobody was pushing forward electric vehicles. It was Tesla. So it's really great to see them be rewarded for, for all of the risk that they mm -hmm. took. And then when it comes to investing in a company, obviously you have to think about the leaders, right? So Elon is a visionary, you know, once in a century, if not longer type of human. And But now we talked about Tesla's deep bench. We saw it at Investor Day. That's what a lot of investors like. We don't really know these people well, but we got to hear some of the leaders in different departments speak. And they're just incredibly impressive people that... We always see the greatest talent. Where do they want to work? SpaceX and Tesla. And that stuff matters. You know, it's not going to show up in the financials right away. But over the next five or 10 years with all of that talent in Tesla's agile umbrella, right, where they can implement new new products, new changes in a matter of weeks or months when it would take legacy auto years to do. That stuff will play itself out. And so it's yeah, it's kind of the trifecta, right? The perfect company, perfect timing, perfect leaders and uh, yeah. just how to keep executing. Well, I love that you started this by reminding us what it was like uh, when it first started, because it is, uh, you know, we, we always talk about 10, 2010 to 2012, uh, 23, but actually it started even earlier than that. It took them a long time to get where we are today, and we needed to set the base of where we are. But I'm also very curious at the, when you mentioned the word flywheel and that we're actually at the point, I want you to explain to me, give me examples of what you think that means, but that it, it's one of those things where because it took so long to set the base of where we're at, but now things are going to basically, you know, move faster. And because they have so many parts that are all helping each other, that's the part you can explain a little bit more. It's interesting, perfect timing, but uh, it, it took us a while to get here, to, to mm -hmm. get to this moment and all the, you know, the suffering and the pain that uh, Elon himself had to go through and the company had to go through to get here. But yeah. uh, we're now at the flywheel. So things are happening. What was your uh, intention when you said that word? Yeah, so it's just once you have that momentum built, 
right? That's when a lot can happen. And you kind of get through that early adopter phase and then you approach the mass market. And we're kind of teetering on that in a lot of different markets, maybe mega packs a little bit earlier. But I think one thing with the flywheel to keep in mind is the data aspect, because that's where mm -hmm. Tesla is really differentiated here. So let's think of a product, for example. I mean, people know about the cars, but let's just talk about mega pack, for example. So yeah. Again, it's a brand new industry, really. Battery energy storage. It's been around, but it's now hitting the mainstream and more companies are making these announcements. So replacing peaker plants and they, they do have other use cases, right? Obviously having one at a Tesla supercharger. But as they ramp up production, they're, they're still ramping the Lathrop facility. So they're probably 50% capacity. So they're not even halfway to their first facility of which they're going to have multiples, you know, five, 10 in the future. As they, of course, grow scale, you know, the factory utilization costs will become lower and it's just that's the efficiency of, um, you know, manufacturing, but with the data. So when you sell more products, again, like as I said earlier, the price will come down, just more manufacturing, but they'll use that data when it comes to auto bidder and each customer as each each one of these deals is done and implemented and they actually see, OK, it's in in practice. We're making money, as we've seen in Australia and some other places. The economics make sense. The Inflation Reduction Act has made it even better. So now they don't have to be tied to solar generation anymore. They can be standalone. That's a huge deal. So all these companies considering mega packs, now they, they have more options to choose how they want to set up their business. But with that data, not only from the customers and the feedback and working with them, but also from the software side, like, you know, on the car side, Tesla can see do customers how often do they move their seats? How often do they do X, Y, Z? No other companies right. can do that so far, maybe on a smaller scale. Yeah. No one can do it to the depth and breadth that Tesla can. So these other companies, maybe they can do surveys and they can you know, guess, but Tesla has the real data. So that's when they start spinning the flywheel and really target their products for their customers better than anybody else can. So again, once it starts spinning, you get you know energy in motion and it's the same from a business standpoint. The, the clients start speaking well of the product and the company because Tesla does things the right way. The, the economics and the financials make sense. The products keep getting better. Again, on the software side, using the data, Tesla really is a software first company. That's what they've done better than everybody else. And all the other automakers now are admitting like, you know what? We need to do everything different. Like you saw that Ford interview. Um, yes. just talking about how they have to deal with, you know, 150 different suppliers and different software and to make them all work. It's just crazy when you really think about it, but <laughs> yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I love it. You're absolutely correct. That, I'm so glad you brought this up because it is, it is the flywheel that's going to change how fast, uh, things are going to change and improve for Tesla and how fast they're going to accomplish things. And people are not yet ready or not yet thinking about how fast it's going to happen. So let's go through each of the businesses. And I'm curious to see what your estimation is of kind of like where they are in the progress of, um, you know, in, in their own markets, how successful they'll be and when will they actually start becoming material to Tesla. And then from there, like, you know, we're going to imagine what the Tesla might look like in five years and then in 10 years. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can start with energy. You kind of started with that. I think we, we know most of us in this audience know about the cars. So we can talk about energy. We can talk about the bot. We can talk about um, AI. And then we can even talk about, uh, you know, <laughs> the future. What else are you thinking? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's yeah, start with yeah. the energy. You had a great tweet this morning talking about yet another massive agreement that Tesla just signed. Uh, and you kind of counted it in terms of how much, um, how much that really means to Tesla. You want to start mm -hmm. with that one? Sure. Yeah. So the short story, I think it was a deal uh, with Neo and about 224 mega packs doing the math that works out to about over a hundred million dollars in profit. Now they don't get that in a check today. You know, that, that happens in the future as the, the um, project hits different milestones. But again, these are going to be recurring revenue streams that Tesla has with each one of these deals. When it comes to energy, very early days, like you know, in a baseball game, we're talking literal first inning. Mm. They have their first actual mega pack facility being ramped. You know, they have one announced in China. The next one will most likely be somewhere over in Europe. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear that in the mm. next, you know, six to 12 months. But um, from an energy standpoint, again, I think we're going to get the next iteration of Powerwall, hopefully later this year. There, there have been some clues on that one. But I think the mega pack is 
really it just gets at again the total addressable market for that is almost incomprehensible <laughs> you know you want to talk about i hate to throw around unlimited like infinite demand yeah. but for the next few years that's kind of how it is and anybody in the industry that i've talked to has agreed you know i've had the pleasure of doing some interviews and some t chatting offline with some people and there are a few there are some other players it's not like tesla's the only company making these products but e e there's so much demand i mean tesla has a backlog of over two years for the mega pack mm -hmm. so we need more than just tesla to do this but um yeah, short story energy. I really do still think it's early days. And when it comes to Tesla stock and the valuation, this is one of the biggest, I think, disconnects, you know, as we see what Tesla's doing and, you know, I don't do models anymore. I used to, but I'll just say there's a delta between what Wall Street thinks Tesla energy is going to do and what it is going to do. And I think mm -hmm. that maybe a little bit toward the end of this year, but more so into 2024 in the back half. Again, once a lot of these projects start actually hitting the financials, Wall Street's going to say, oh, wow, like uh, we need to change some numbers. And so I do think there's some upside lingering on the energy side. But yeah, we're at very early days when it comes to Megapack for sure. Okay. And what about RoboTaxi? What's your uh, evaluation of where that's sitting right now? Yeah, what a fun conversation. And, uh, you know, again, from a Wall Street analyst standpoint, feels like they're not giving Tesla any credit for this. I mean, okay. Gary Black, all due respect, yeah, I know you've talked exactly. to him before, but he yeah. has said many times that he believes other companies will have autonomy mm -hmm. right when Tesla does. I mm -hmm. personally, I'll just be honest, I think that's one of the worst takes I've ever heard. The only way that's going to happen in my eyes is if Tesla licenses that technology the day they have it. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you like want to get into the conversation of why, but the short story is what most of the people have heard. It's just that mm -hmm. what other... other what other companies are doing, it's just not scalable the way Tesla mm -hmm. is doing it with the maps and the cost. And um, Tesla has, you know, customer cars gathering the data and the whole fleet, the whole nine. So, um, yeah, to what you were saying the, earlier, right, which is the data. Uh, no other yeah. company is capturing all this data. And if you believe what Elon has said, that you need three things in order to get RoboTaxi. You need a supercomputer, you have neural nets, and you have, I need a billion miles of driving uh, data to be able to analyze. If you don't have any of those things, you can't do global free free drive kind of um, uh, RoboTaxi. But I, mm -hmm. I'm with you. I don't think RoboTaxi is something that is, has any competitors, but you know, you always have to keep your eye out whether or not it's true or not. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's fun to have the conversation of, you know, when are they going to have a robo taxi in operation? It's tough, though, because from a regulatory standpoint, there's really nothing out there publicly. There's very little information to gather on what that's going to look like because it's never happened. I do honestly, you know, you have to give some credit to like Cruise and Waymo because they are somewhat paving the way for that regulatory environment right. to have a baseline to go off of in those markets that they're in. So I don't want to like brush them off that there's going to be a use case for that. And I, I actually hope they can make it work and start making money because it's just great for humans, right? To have that option available to yeah. give mobility back to people that don't have it. I think that's a beautiful thing. I just don't think they'll be able to do it at the scale that Tesla will. Now, when they do it again, I, I, I don't spend too much time trying to figure it out. I'm just pretty confident it's going to happen at some point, you know, whether it's, you know, two years, five years, 10 years, um, fairly confident in that outcome. So yeah. And again, when it comes to the valuation aspect that nobody knows, you can be the best forecaster. You can do all, run all the models. I've read all the arc models and everybody else that does it. And you're just kind of shooting in the dark because there's never been anything like that. And you have to weigh in, you know, how many people will buy into this? Like, you know, I think about people like my parents who may not be as comfortable with technology. How fast will people be ready to trust getting in a car without a driver? I don't know. I mean, I know plenty of people mm -hmm. will, but plenty of people won't. So there's just a lot of, you know, things like that, that you have to weigh ultimately. But all I do know is there is absolutely progress being made. Right now, Tesla is selling the software for $15,000. They have enhanced autopilot. I think it's $6,000 for that. Um, and yeah, it's just they're gathering the data. More and more people are having it. It's rolling out now in right-hand drive markets, and it's going global, and they'll get a new set of data. And so it's absolutely making progress. It's getting better, and I'm just enjoying watching it unfold. It's actually quite shocking, I think, uh, that 
almost every uh, jurisdiction, country, they're supporting uh, full self-driving. They're supporting uh, testing robotaxi. You know, everybody kept saying that, no, you'll never get regulation, but it's the opposite that's happening. You know, knock on wood, right? <laughs> knock on wood. But so far, we've not seen NHTSA coming in and saying, you know, we're going to slow this down because I think they're seeing the data and showing that the data is actually very um, supportive. And then you're hearing that Europe actually just actually um, accelerated when they're going to allow the testing of full self-driving in Europe to January of this of 2024. And of course, we're hearing that uh, China's doing it and uh, other countries. So that's great. So yeah, so you're being very uh, confident about FSD, but you're not necessarily going to put a time frame for it uh, because of all these other moving parts. Okay, so we've got... Uh, what, what, what are you, where are you sitting on ro on human ro humanoid robots? So you said earlier that you thought it was uh, not yet a product. What's your opinion on this uh, this 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 market? Sure. So before we do that, I would say on the China thing, I've also heard yeah. reporting that they're not ready to do FSD. I don't know how accurate mm -hmm. it is, but that mm -hmm. those reports were not accurate. Just wanted mm -hmm. to put that out there. Um, and you mentioned one other thing. Uh, the Europe in January. I um, I've lost my train of thought, but, uh, so we'll, we can skip that one. Maybe I'll think of it. Um, on okay, Optimus, yeah, yeah. I do. So I've come around on Optimus because when it was first announced, I said, all right, you know, five, 10 years, I'm not really going to think about it too much. It's going to be one mm -hmm. of those projects they have to figure out, but <laughs> okay. The video, the clip that they showed us you know, uh, at investor day was pretty awesome and doing some things that I definitely was not expecting. So I will not at all be surprised. And I actually now think that Optimus will be in the Giga Mexico. Like, you know, yeah. I'm pretty confident they're going to have at least a small task for Optimus in the Giga Mexico production line. Once that happens, then people's minds will start to open to, okay, like, when it really has a real world use case where it can replace a human and that flywheel moves a little bit, that'll be a big deal. Um, now, I don't know anything about, you know, production speeds or rates, but um, it's not a product I can really add much value in talking about. I know there are people better suited to get into the details and specifics and the engineering on that side, because it's really not a, a space I've spent a ton of time thinking about or researching, to be honest. But mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think it'll be an actual product with a use case sometime in the next year, or if, at least year or two. Okay, there you go. I agree with you, by the way. I think that the bots is going to be faster than we all think because it's actually easier to do than uh, the cars, which is shocking. But uh, we'll see what happens. So, you know, let's get back to like the flywheel and the state of innovation. Well, let's, let's, you know, dream a little bit of where we're headed and then we'll come back uh, second half of this conversation. I want to go drill right into the actual specifics of what's happening in the businesses. But what, uh, what, what new products are you expecting? So based on everything you know about Tesla, um, we're talking about the HVAC, we're talking about the electric vehicle aircraft and boats. What, what do you think that they might, uh, they might uh, endeavor next? Yeah. So in terms of the sequence, who knows? I mean, I, I would obviously expect the Robotaxi platform and the cyber van to be next and mm -hmm. uh, Powerwall 3 should be coming. Beyond that, though, I think, you know, step one is obviously going to be covering all aspects of the auto market. So whichever segment Tesla, they need a product in to cover that, which they're doing now and will continue to do you know, they're, they're going to do that. How far does that go? Do they ever get into more of the actual RV scene? I, I don't really know. Again, like, I don't want to speculate and just guess here. But um, what talking about dreaming a little bit, if you think about really 10 years into the future, how big Tesla can be, I almost think look at like neighborhoods, like these ecosystems that are built on the Tesla foundation, all of these new built homes that would have solar powerwall, electric charging, obviously the electric cars, Tesla home HVAC, and whatever else they can essentially build in with their software and their app into that blueprint, essentially, of these sustainable, energy-friendly, clean, electric neighborhoods that Tesla will be able to do better than anybody else, at least that we've seen so far. So not that Tesla would ever get into like building houses, but I'm speaking more from a 
contracting standpoint, having deals in place for whole neighborhood developments mm -hmm. using Tesla's products integrated in one to have the virtual power plants right in a neighborhood setting where you're not even reliant on the grid. You have your own microgrid, you know, mm -hmm. with a mega pack for the neighborhood, right? Um, so yeah, and, and I think boats, it, it sounds like maybe even on a small scale, there was talks about having little Tesla, almost like a pontoon boat for Giga Texas and the, you know, <laughs> ecological paradise they're supposed to have there. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of like my, my short answer, I guess. Yeah. That, I, I do agree with the homes ideas being like the most likely because they already have the HVAC VAC system. It's a ma massive market. It can save so much energy, but obviously it, it kind of applies to Mars. And like you said, I, lo I love that you started this conversation with the flywheel concept because it really is one of those things where you look at all the things that they've built and then what's the most logical next thing that just kind of fits perfectly as that, you know, beautiful puzzle pieces that are coming together in this grand scheme of things. So yeah, I, I think that's going to be some version of a home. Interesting. I mean, you know, he's talked about it, but he said, you know, sometime in the future when I, we have more time, mm -hmm. but they do have more time. <laughs> the cash yep. is building up. They've already built, they know how to build gigafactories. It's almost at that stage with the gigafactory where it's kind of like now replication. Once they built the Giga Mexico, they'll just take that same footprint and keep it going. But what, mm -hmm. so let's go back to what's happening this year. Uh, obviously the big turning point seems to be the partnerships with GM and uh, Ford in terms of the superchargers. But are you one to believe that this is just the beginning of these partnerships, that this is kind of the foot in the door and there's going to be more? Uh, were you shocked that this happened so soon? Like many people are really were not anticipating something like this. What was your reaction when you heard all this? Uh, I wouldn't say shocked just because it, it, it makes sense, right? It's just, it's better. It's more logical. The, the infrastructure is there. So if these other companies were to drop their pride and just say, what's best for our consumer, it's that, and it's not a tough decision. You know, when it comes to manufacturing and logistics, that's challenging, but first principles mindset has to be what is best for the consumer. How do we get yeah. there faster? Because they're behind and that's the answer. So not shocked. We saw Rivian this morning. I don't know if you saw that, but Rivian adopted yes. the next two. So that's great. Again, they kind of have to. They did say they're going to continue building out the adventure network. So I'm assuming they'll just throw on some uh, NAX adapters and ports and such. But 2025 is their timeline for uh, adopting that into their vehicles. And we've already seen so many third party companies adopt it. You know, how many are left? <laughs> I know obviously some are, but there have been a lot. It's been pretty quick. So there will undoubtedly be more, at, of course, at least for the United States. I think we're going to have three. We'll have the United States with the NAX. We'll have Europe with most likely the, their version of CCS. And then China's on their own thing. So, and that's fine. How often do vehicles change continents? Not that much. Mm -hmm. And with adapters, I think it's all good. So, yeah, I think uh, it's super exciting. It's going to give Tesla a ton of credibility, even if it doesn't mean too much from a financial standpoint. It's not going to be zero. I think some people are thinking, well, Tesla's just going to give it away for free. That's not the case, even though they'll give away certain parts on the hardware side at cost. Um, Tesla will be making money somehow in this deal, uh, and we'll get you know more information on that in time. But uh, yeah, before I forget, I did want to mention, like, not to change up the combo too much, but Mm -hmm. Even things like Dojo that most of the yeah. public doesn't even know exists. So if I were to yeah. go talk to 20 of my friends, right, that they know what I do, they might watch a video every now and then. Uh, I would ask them like, okay, what do you think about Tesla Dojo? They'll say what? <laughs> yeah. No idea. And this could <laughs> yes. be a $100 billion plus business over the next five or 10 years. So <laughs> things like that, you know, there's just this huge disconnect between the public and even people in the Tesla community, like I'm not a dojo expert, you know, I don't have the chip AI type brain. That's not my gift. Um, but I listen to people whose gift it is. And I'm like, oh boy, like, you know, it might not turn out to be as big as we, what the ceiling is, but it probably won't be zero. You know, I'd be fairly confident in Tesla with the data and the AI and the years of designing its own hardware computers, FSD computers, that they'll be able to figure out something, a use for it. Um, so yeah, there's just so many little things like that, that people have, you know, no idea about. Yeah. And the conversation earlier, that this is a flywheel, that this is about data. And so they built Dojo and AI to support 
uh, like you were saying it earlier, AI supports every part of the business, but they, you know, we're doing it for RoboTaxi FSD. And so now they can take what they built for many years and, and kind of take advantage of that and then apply it elsewhere. But, you know, Tesla is an AI company. Where's your thinking about that? Like you just said, the public doesn't have no idea. And they're mm -hmm. rewarding all these other companies that it's clear that they've kind of marketed themselves as an AI company, but Tesla is not being seen as one. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard Elon say that he's going to make sure that Tesla has some role in, in, in helping uh, build AI and general AI? You love to see it, right? Yeah, I mean, I want yeah. that fire back in Elon to want to he, to have that drive to feel like he needs to get on top again. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure from an auto standpoint, he's like, all right, we're on top. He knows it. You know, it's not it's not hard to see for anybody paying attention. But from an AI standpoint, Tesla still has to earn that, right? That naming, that label. Even though I personally think they should have it now, it's just again from a Wall Street perspective. When you mm -hmm. the problem is when you look at Tesla's financials, right? This is where people need to understand where Wall Street comes from. They look at six to 12 months. They're not looking at five years. They're not looking at 10 years. So we see all of this future and think, oh my gosh, like Tesla's going to be worth X, Y, Z. Why, why is Wall Street not getting that? They're not looking at that. Okay. So we're just looking at different things. Hmm. I would add also, they don't have all day to look at Tesla and they follow multiple companies. So you can't expect them to be on the level of, you know, one of us or Rob or anybody that talks about Tesla because we do this most of the day. Um, so understanding that is key, but getting back to why I looped in wall street so yes. they look at the financials right of tesla and there's not any direct line items that are going to be attributable to ai technology but it's all built in like i said tesla is this ai company and ai touches every aspect so it's part of the flywheel and getting it going but until tesla has some revenue that can be directly attributed to artificial mm -hmm. intelligence whether it's the robotaxi or optimus or Mm -hmm. licensing hardware for or whatever it may be. Um, I do think Wall Street's going to be slow on the uptake. But again, like I know you talk about the it's a narrative stock. It is. Mm -hmm. So how much of this recent run up is people starting to understand that part of the story, giving Tesla a little bit of AI credit and watching what's going on and how many people have FSD, the global rollout. So it's tough to pinpoint exactly. But Again, I just think there's such a discrepancy between where Tesla really is as a world leader in AI. The, the lines that Elon repeats that we all get bored of hearing because he says it all the time, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's a reason. You know, he wants, he will be on the record of saying like, you know, all of these things that he said, many of them have come true. The main one that hasn't is the timing of FSD. And mm -hmm. of course, I wish he would just be quiet on that one at this point, but <laughs> he's going to be himself and the good and the bad, I'm here for it. <laughs> so yeah, on the AI front, I do think they're much further ahead than Wall Street and the markets are giving them credit for. They don't really have an AI valuation yet. Okay, they don't have an NVIDIA type uh, PE or PEG and they're still, they're, it's higher than it was six months ago. Um, but, you know, are we going to say that their their future of RoboTaxis and Optimus and all of that auto bidder type AI is built into the valuation? Mm. No, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not. It'll come soon, I'm sure. Okay, the, go, going back to the partnerships, because I think this is critical. And I saw that you've done quite a number of deep dive interviews, uh, reviews of all these different companies in the uh, the uh, you know the the legacy car companies. Curious to hear what your thinking is on where they're at. And then I do want to continue just thinking about your partnership question. Like, so they partner with Supercharger. Do you see these companies having to be forced to eventually partner in other ways? And what's your timing uh, forecast for that? Sure. So uh, I don't think they'll be forced necessarily. I mean, at the end of the day, they always will control their own destiny. You know, if they just want to ride out their current products and let it die. I mean, that's an option. You know, I don't think <laughs> okay. they will do that. Yeah. I don't think they will do that, of course. But the point stands like, I don't think they'll be forced. But indirectly from an from a robo taxi standpoint you gotta think that they will be their hand will be uh mm -hmm. forced you know just because if tesla solves it even in the next two or three years i can't imagine anyone else doing it sooner like true generalized put drop the car anywhere on the planet at least in the united states and drive me no one else is doing that anytime soon no one's even close tesla is relatively seemingly close so i do think that they can't let Tesla run away with that lead by themselves for building out the fleets and doing all this without 
getting a piece of it. So indirectly, I do think they kind of will be forced at that point. Um, but yeah, where the other companies are at from a partnership standpoint, it's, it's a huge year for GM. I think the back half of this year and the first half of next year is going to literally make or break their entire future because it's the all team rollout. They've been talking so much about how it's coming. All these products are coming on the all team platform. So if they swing and miss with these, you know, the Equinox mm -hmm. and the Blazer, it's going to be big trouble because they're going to run into an oversupply. They have like four North American battery factories in that it's, it's supposed to be 120 gigawatt hours of combined capacity at scale. That's a lot of batteries for a company that doesn't have very much demand yet. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, like yeah. they're kind of planning to have huge demand. So it's a very important time for them. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I'm definitely more rooting for Ford. I like Farley. He's been super candid and, uh, you know, the F-150 Lightning and the Mach-E are solid products. Um, but yeah, again, I don't, I think both of them when it comes to licensing FSD is most likely going to be something that happens. Of all the car companies, who do you think is closest uh, to uh, Tesla? When I interviewed Corey Steuben, he said that uh, he thought that uh, uh, Hyundai, Hyundai, Kia are probably next in line. Yeah, so... I thought about it before and I did watch that with him. And obviously I, I'm not going to disagree with Corey. He, he knows his stuff. So from a technical product standpoint, it, it does seem like they have the best mm -hmm. EV platform. Um, mm -hmm. But I would default to saying that if Ford can scale its production and work out all of what it was doing earlier this year with the F-150 Lightning and the Mach-E, given their customer base, Farley being on board, knowing what needs to happen, being the first one to drop his pride and say, all right, Tesla, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, I just think that's going to pay dividends for them in the future. So give them some time and I think they'll be able to figure it out. But right now, the closest it does seem like the Hyundai Kias of the world, EV wise are right there. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to disagree with Corey. I, I would agree with that statement. Yeah. So that's the thing about the, was, you know, wrapping it back up to the partnership. Ford was the first to move, you know, he was been, uh, Jim Farley has been so, uh, transparent about everything that's happening. And in that space, this call, uh, Elon twice asked <laughs> Jim, Hey, you know, we also could do software for you. And it was funny that Jim redirected to saying, Hey, I'm very excited about you guys doing this at refinery, <laughs> but I do think that, you know, him bringing up the 150 suppliers or the challenges they're having with software, they're going to try to give it a shot, but eventually they're going to just partner with Tesla. And I think that's going to happen. And as soon as they do, I think Tesla Ford will survive. And mm -hmm. so I do think that that's why it's all going to happen sooner than we think. And it's, and it's on its way. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Oh man, there's so many good questions I want to ask you, but you know, I, just pause for a second because you have an incredible channel. Um, your your uh, videos that you do is just top notch quality. Just a little bit of background: you you were doing financial advising, and then you I think you said you did a few other things, but then you you launch a channel. Tell us how this whole thing started, and uh, tell me what you're planning to do with the channel and what you're doing with it because it's just so amazing. I mean, you have one of the best channels that are out there. Just a quality is just so top notch. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you. You're too kind. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you kind of have to bring it in the Tesla space. There's so much top notch content. And again, I tip my cap to Rob and, you know, listening to his podcast in the car years ago before any of us were on YouTube. So kind of where the seeds were planted for me, but it's been a huge blessing, honestly. Um, going forward, I definitely want to keep growing it. I have some things in the works that I'll hopefully unveil here in the next month or two that I've been working on dating back to last year, really. So pretty excited for that. But I do want to give people some background because I don't talk about it much. But yeah. prior to this, I was a financial advisor for four years. I worked with Edward Jones, lived in Arizona for a year and went through their extensive training and then came back home to my hometown. Got to manage north of 60 million dollars while i was there so just helping families and learn that like people are very different when it comes to money and even though i think tesla might be hands down the best risk adjusted investment on the market that doesn't mean that everybody should own it i i do want to say people really need to understand their own risk tolerance they need to understand how much leverage how 
close to all in can they be and still be mentally okay and not be hmm. stressing out and not emailing people should i be selling get it taken out margin like just because somebody else does it and just because tesla is such a great investment and we all know and agree it doesn't mean you should be in it hmm. like i need that point to land so just because yeah overall your well-being is important and i know there are people that at the end of 2022 did what they sold their tesla because they couldn't take it anymore they just mm -hmm. they saw their account value go down too much and they panic sold and my heart goes out to those people because i know that emotion and empathy is real but for me i am in the public markets all in tesla but i'm a very risky person i'm a risk taker by nature calculated risk of course but um so yeah that's my background real quick and I uh, just, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, do my own thing, be location agnostic. So my wife and I can bounce around to different places and I can work from there. But yeah, I want to keep doing electrified. But as we were chatting a little bit offline, I'm into a lot of things. I have my real estate license, love performance, athletic, athletic training, wellness. Um, so I might branch out and do some other things in the future. I have the time, but um, we'll see. Yeah, electrified is not going anywhere been a huge blessing and um started yeah. off doing more deep dive videos but just transition into the news it's easier not having to come up with topics and i really enjoy it it's what i wanted to do and i like keeping up with what's going on each day well you're doing a great job with that okay Thanks. so uh what's your conviction in tesla so how did you discover tesla i love the way that you you know obviously a financial advisor you come up with a right uh, frame of mind and then but then you said you're a risk taker What's your conviction in Tesla? Where do you see the stock? Uh, again, not financial advice because you were a financial advisor. Yep, yep. Uh, but what, where do you see it uh, headed in the future? Yeah, so, well, up, right? Um, I was actually introduced to Tesla looking at a Model S. I was in, uh, I was at my cousin's house and one of their neighbors just bought one and I got to go in it and ride in it and play with the touchscreen. And I'm a huge tech nerd. I've been for a long time and I said, wow. This is awesome. So from that standpoint, I started looking into Tesla. And so true story, I uh, I was that guy in 2012 making custom Tesla shirts that I would wear to poker games with my friends. And uh, wow. they would all be the ones hating on Tesla. Like, oh, what, why do you like that company? Like making golf carts, that whole <laughs> narrative. Um, and I said, I'm, I told him at the time, I'm like, if your, your ownership of Tesla stock should not be zero. And in a couple of years, you will be thanking me. And for every five year period, that's essentially been the case. <laughs> and while not financial advice, again, like just being honest, that, that is what I'm foreseeing for Tesla in the future. Looking at valuations, we've had Elon say that Tesla will hit that $4 trillion mark, you know, a combination of Apple and Saudi Aramco or two Apples. So $4 trillion, we're at what, you know, call it eight, nine hundred billion now. So that's a smooth 3x, if you want to call it that. Um, I know a lot of people like to talk about the, the 8 trillion, 10 trillion and in the future, sure, but we have to not get over our skis too much because has there ever been a company over 4 trillion to date? I don't mm -hmm. think so. Um, so yeah, we have to kind of keep those things in mind, but where's my conviction come from? Again, it just stems from the, the total addressable markets that Tesla is in. They're the biggest ones on the planet, automotive, energy, robo taxis, brand new Optimus, brand new. Don't even know mm -hmm. how big those markets are. <laughs> they're already a global company. So all these people that talk about BYD, they're still mainly China. Now, yes, they're expanding slowly into Europe, but they still have to prove themselves in Europe. And who knows if they'll ever make it here. Well, guess what? Tesla's already United States, China, Europe, and many other countries. Already global, already proven, already really the entire world is trying to get their business. That's not going to stop. Their products will only get better. Their prices will only get better. Their manufacturing will only get better. They have the talent. That's where everybody wants to go. They, they have a proven track record. They have proven demand. When it comes to the resource side, which is key, and it's not fun to talk about, but Tesla has the most leverage there. Why? Because they have the most demand. They have the longest standing relationships with these companies. They have the best locations for the superchargers. It's just like there are so many little things that add into this it's Tesla soup that is just getting better with each passing year, more talent and more training and more. So, you know, again, I could go on and on and on, but yeah, yeah, at the end of the day, they just have a once in a lifetime leader with a perfectly timed mission and product lineup in huge markets with the best product. So like, it's not that complicated at the end of the day. <laughs> I love it. Okay. I mean, so I do have to ask a question then. What do you think are the yeah. risks? 
or Tesla at this point. And I kind of couch it with, if you look at Tesla today, Elon is going global. He's, he's going around shaking hands with every world leader you can think of. They're all reaching out to him. Every company wants to do a major partnership. And like you said, because they have so much scale, every company, every country wants to give them the best deal possible to get them to go there. Uh, what, you know, given that like it's a very different story than it was 2012 where nobody even mm -hmm. want to touch them. They, they think they're going to fail today. They're the clear leader and they've proven themselves. So, you know what I mean? Like things are, should theoretically just get easier and easier. Uh, what is the risks? Uh, you know, tell me what you think about the mineral resource issue, the battery constraints, and then what other are the major risks that we should be thinking about and be concerned about? It's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. I am a big fan of steel manning arguments. I think our culture as a whole really needs to adopt that practice for everything, not just investments, but life and what you believe. Always challenge your assumptions and um, seek the truth and answers and don't be afraid to listen to the other side because that's a skill that will pay dividends. Um, with that said, I think one of the risks that not a lot of people talk about is this next gen product. Like if they plan mm -hmm. to sell millions of products a year, they have to nail it. Like it has to be so desirable that that many people want it because a lot of the Model Y people have wanted it because it's different. Like personally, I've always wanted to have a different car. Like, I, you know, it's funny because I drive a Honda CRV right now that's paid off. It's the most common car where I live, right? Honda is the biggest dealership here. So I'm a hypocrite, I suppose. But uh, the point stands, like if they want to sell that many units, it's going to have to be a very desirable product. So people talk about, is it going to be a cyber lineup or will it be more like the Model 3? I almost hope it's more like the Model 3 because I think that'll appeal to a wider audience. So, mm -hmm. you know, if they come out and take a take a big risk with that product and kind of miss a large segment of that market, that is fundamentally going to change the 20 million number mark. And um, that's a really big next step that is obviously a big part of what's going to vault Tesla to the next level of, you know, huge mm -hmm. mass market manufacturer, but we don't, we have no idea what it's going to look like, you know, how Tesla are they going to be removing things and doing it for what they see as the autonomous future? Well, there's a lot of people that want a car that they can handle normally, even though in reality, they don't know what they want. I get that whole argument. So mm -hmm. I think that's one. Um, you know, of course, Elon, the key man risk, like, God forbid, if something were to happen to him, that'd be, he is the brand, you know, and I, we talk about their deep bench and they have incredible talent, but he's still the visionary. He's still the problem solver. He's still just, it's hard to articulate what he means to the company and the world. And he's just different. There is no replacing him. And I think everybody knows that. Um, but the good news is, you know, there really isn't any risk on the balance sheet side. So Tesla's CapEx, call it, you know, around $7 billion a year. Even after accounting for that, their free cash flow is still positive. Now, could it dip negative in quarter two? I think there's at least a non-zero chance, but even if it does for one quarter, it doesn't matter, right? Long term, they're generating free cash flow, which is after all expenses, and they already have over $20 billion in cash on the balance sheet. So from that standpoint, they're not going to be forced to, you know, issue shares or raise debt. They're in a great position financially. So while other companies still have that financial risk, Tesla doesn't. So that's a huge deal. But again, I think it just comes down to execution and getting the next wave of people to buy in because you can argue that most of the early adopters are exhausted. So they're going to be trading their products in and there's going to be more used Teslas. And that's good because it'll lower the price and hopefully that'll bring in the next wave, but Tesla has to make sure they are attracting the next wave. So far, so good, right? I'm not saying that that's a problem now, but over the next few years to go from 2 million units a year to 20, that's a different ball game, an absolutely different ball game from the early adopters to the mass market. Because I talk to a lot of people in my personal life and I'm telling you right now, and I, my community knows that a lot of people still really don't get it. You know, mm -hmm. the first thing when they talk about EVs is the grid's not ready. They catch on fire mm -hmm. too much. Like those are still very real narratives that Tesla is going to have to overcome. And I think they will. Absolutely. That's why I'm convicted in the stock. But yeah, it's just it won't be without challenges and new problems that arise on the resource side. Again, it, there's going to be some times there might be seasons where they're limited when it comes to a certain um, resource or product or chip, you know, whatever it may be. 
but it's not, I mean, they've said with their master plan three, it's nothing that can't be overcome. So it's all going to be short term and problem solving. And that's really what they do best. So. Well, that's the first time I heard that Dylan. Thank you for bringing that up to me. Cause I personally have not even thought of what you just said. That was brilliant. <clears throat> that, uh, the jet next gen three is critical because it's mass market. It's gotta be something that it's, uh, can't be too out there, like you said. Otherwise, the masses won't accept it, and that could be a mm -hmm. risk. Because I just always assume that Tesla's been hitting out of the park, and they'll continue hitting out of the park. What yeah. I would want them to do is, you know, we're going to speculate a little bit what we think the Gen Three platform is. But what I was hoping that they would do, it's modular, right? We've heard them say it's a, it's going to be the <clears throat> unbox process. What I thought that that meant, it what that allows them to do is create multiple different variants of a car. If because of the way that it's structured, so they can create a skateboard, front and rear casting, and then they can put different kinds of you know structure uh, shapes on top of it. If it's going to be a van, if it's going to be a two-person car, is a four-person car, a six-person car, they just attach like Lego pieces. Um, maybe that could also then kind of afford them what what would be a robo taxi, which in my mind should be it's going to be out there, right? It's not something that people will have to choose to buy, but I think it should be on a Cybertruck platform with kind of like this, you know, steel so that it's, you feel very safe inside, may not need to have a front and rear, but then they do need uh, some sort of car that's like, that, you know, that, that, that's, that's the Model 2, I guess, the compact car that's a little bit more acceptable that people will be willing to buy. That part is interesting. Um, what Any guesses on what the Gen 3 platform might be and any kind of, uh, yeah, what, just a, a guess, but what would you, what's your forecast of what it might look like? Yeah, so uh, good question. And uh, to your point about the modular thing, it's almost like what GM is planning to do with Altium. So I understand it from a scale perspective, makes complete sense. And I know that Tesla will continue to use certain products across the lineup, whether it's heat pump, whatever they, you know, FSD hardware for, they'll always do that. Because again, it get economies of scale, like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. But one of Tesla's unique advantages has been engineering their products for that product. Like they're not taking an ice line and slapping on some EV. Like they are first principles ground up. We are making this product from a first principle standpoint, and it's going to be the best that this product can be. And now they, as I said, there are certain things that they can share, but for them to just kind of shift into this new platform where they start doing like a, a van, a robo taxi, the model two all on one platform. I personally, that wouldn't be my guess. Mm -hmm. Although mm -hmm. I would understand it if they're optimizing for scale. So again, like how hard do they think it's going to be to get to 20 million? That could absolutely make sense. So I don't want to discredit that thought. I just personally think, again, like the way I would design a cyber van or a regular van would be very different than the Model 2. So maybe, again, similar skateboard, a lot of, a lot of things will be shared. But so I guess at the end of the day, like how different is the modular approach? It's a fair question. Um, what was your original question though? That was it. Yeah. I mean, it was basically, what do you think the Gen 3 platform is going to look like? Mm. And, uh, and, and that's what you were saying that you, you're not as, uh, uh, yeah, guessing that it would be as modular as I was thinking, but, um, what, what's your take on the, the factory is the product and would they ever create factories for other companies or that just, you know, people are saying there's no way they'll do that because they just need every factory for themselves. But if the factory is the product, uh, would they not start to kind of, uh, open that up for other other companies to be able to use. You know, or it's an interesting kind of, thought. Yeah. No, it, interesting thought. I wouldn't say anytime soon. Um, just yeah. because to do that well, I you obviously have to have a an understanding of what the end goal is for that factory, what the products are, what um what's gonna make that product different from a manufacturing standpoint, what are your numbers, what are your demand numbers, what you know. Where is all of the supply coming from? So the point being, you really have to understand the business at a deep level to build a factory down to the nitty gritty. So like it would just be such a time investment to do that where maybe they sell or license a blueprint for something like a modular strategy of building a car or let give some of that information out, but to actually have like a division that then goes and like spends time with other companies to build it. I personally couldn't foresee that anytime yeah. before 2030, maybe the next decade, it could make some sense. 
because you're right. I mean, it is a product. It is a specialty added to the list of things that people don't understand why Tesla is so different. And with each new factory, it gets better and better. I mean, with each one, they've changed pretty big things. But yeah, to do that level of help for another company, I don't know. I will say I don't see it right now. Yeah, no, I don't think so either. It's just a, a fun question. And, um, you know, maybe a factory is a service. <laughs> and then the robots, the bots, uh, there was a statement apparently by Tom Jew saying that you know, Giga Nueve, Nueve Leon is going to have 5,000 bots. He apparently made that statement. I haven't found it, but... Uh, when, like after uh, Investor Day? Yeah, uh, not after, no, no. This is even before when he was just talking about at him when he was talking about the Gen Three uh, platform, yeah. Okay, and, yeah. interesting. I didn't see that. One. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're really bullish, as you can see from uh, Tesla, about bots, robot taxi. Mm -hmm. They're very very bullish, and we're actually the ones that are like cautious. But uh, internally in the company, they seem to think it's a solved problem. They seem to, uh, and it goes beyond just Elon. But uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, you you definitely uh, brought up a lot of thoughts in my head here about uh, how to think of things. You're you're very measured. Um, uh, but you know, just back to the original question. So what do you think the future of Tesla will be? Imagine the future. So you got a bunch of comments. What was, uh, what was everybody's answers to that question? What would Tesla look like in, uh, you know, let's say eight or 10 years from now, what would the yeah, world I think, look like? <laughs> yeah, I think that's cool because Tesla's impact on the world will be so large. And again, I don't want to sound like I'm some hyper bull detached from reality, like Tesla's taking over the world. But honestly, when you play these things out, it walks down that path a little bit. Like I really foresee in the 2030s, like Lord willing, hopefully I'm around then still, but they'll be such a big company with their tentacles in so many different mm -hmm. products and regions and ecosystems so deeply rooted in the structure that is charging vehicles and um, the home situation we talked about and this fleet of vehicles and robo taxis all over the world giving people you know autonomy back it almost brings in the question of like monopoly antitrust <laughs> issues like this company is right. too big you know i really do think they'll be the first company that at some point mm -hmm. is so big the government's like what do we do and you know, do we start talking about they have to start spinning off companies and doing something like that so it's, it'll obviously take time it's not going to happen tomorrow but i mean elon's what 57 so i mean he could have easily another 10 15 years or he's still pretty hands-on even if he's his role changes he can still navigate the ship from afar whatever role he's in and again the the, the tesla flywheel with all of their talent and products it's not going to stop i will keep getting new talent and uh so yeah you know i don't want to drill into the detail and ramble on yeah. but i yeah. just think most people, general public especially, has no idea what's coming. Yeah, and and where I'm landing on all this is I think that there's going to be a tremendous amount of partnerships. That's what's just going to happen. They're just going to partner with as many companies as possible so that they're not going to just necessarily take over everything. Um, and everything's going to be software as a service, <laughs> robot mm -hmm. as a service, <laughs> robotaxi service and partner with uh, robotaxi fleet managers, those kind of things. Uh, and of course, own a significant portion of the data and uh, the software. But uh, mm -hmm. this was fun. Thank you so much, Dylan. Really, uh, really, really enjoyed this. You, uh, you I like the way you you think, and um, it, I haven't heard of a few things like this from other people I've talked to. That's I always enjoy that. So everyone, For you sure. already know that Dylan has an incredible YouTube channel called Electrified, top top quality content. He also has a Twitter at Dylan Loomis twenty two. And hopefully you learned something new. Thank you so much, Dylan. Appreciate this. Absolutely. It has been a pleasure. Hopefully I can come back in the future. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really enjoyed it. So thanks for having Appreciate me. It was great. Okay.